final lecture this afternoon is a very special occasion, a very special moment to recognize an extraordinary individual, Tony Pawson. His untimely passing saddened us all. Uh, Tony contributed importantly to Canadian science. I said uh, when I heard the news that he set the bar of excellence in science in this country at a very high level that many would do well to choose to try to emulate. His contributions have been monumental. Uh, we'll hear a, a more detailed account of Tony's contribution from his dear friend and colleague over many years, Dr. John D. Scott, our, our next speaker. Uh, but we do want, uh, through this uh, memorial lecture, to recognize Tony and his influence, not only on Canadian science, but he also contributed importantly to the Gardner Foundation. He was a Gardner recipient himself, but also served for many years on uh, a number of its advisory committees. So let me then introduce uh, Dr. John D. Scott, a longtime friend and collaborator of the late Tony Pawson. He's currently the Edwin G. Krebs Speets Professor of Cell Signaling and Cancer Biology at the University of Washington, Seattle. He's been instrumental in, in the discovery of a family of A kinase anchoring proteins that compartmentalize the cyclic AMP dependent protein kinases and signaling enzymes and their substrates. His research has focused on spatial and temporal organization of cell signaling pathways under normal and pathophysiological states. His laboratory has defined the role of several of these. Uh, enzymes. And he will speak to us today on protein interaction modules, the mechanistic and spatial mediators of signal transduction, and really most importantly, the legacy of Tony Pawson. Please join me in inviting Dr. Scott. So, so thank you for this, this opportunity to to share with you really the, the life and times of, of Tony Poss. And I thank the Gairdner organization for being uh, so caring to allow me the opportunity to really share some memories and a prospective look to the legacy of Tony Poss. So in preparing what I was going to talk to you about today, I thought that the best way to do this was probably to try and develop my presentation around quotes from people that knew Tony very well, and then develop the ideas from his discoveries that came from that. And so to begin with this, I'd like to start with a quote about the man himself, because it's the character of Tony Pawson that really set the discoveries that he made. And so I think you can see that charisma is an enigmatic characteristic that few possess. Likewise, creativity is ordained rather than a learned skill, but when combined with natural curiosity, hard work, and clearly a measure of good fortune, it paves the way for exceptional scientific discovery. Such was Tony Pawson. So with those characteristics, he was primed to be able to make exceptional scientific discoveries. And the area of those discoveries were in cell communication. And so the first person that I asked for advice on what to say was one of my mentors, uh, Nobel laureate Edmund Fisher. And Eddie said, Tony's discoveries radically changed our understanding of how cells transduce external signals and communicate from one to another. So that's, I think, an excellent example of the basis of what Tony was interested in. I also asked one of my trainees, who happened to be Tony's daughter, Catherine, and she came up with an amazingly similar analogy. First of all, growing up with dad, it was easy to lose sight of just how large an impact he had on our understanding of cell communication. His excitement and enthusiasm about discovery were infectious. So with these two quotes to sort of launch us into the science, we really have to look at this diagram that you may have seen briefly at the beginning of the talk. And it's actually taken from, from an, a Scientific American article on I, that, that article that Tony and I wrote in 2000. And it's an artist's 
impression of insulin release from beta cells, which I think is very apropos given the work of Banton and Best here. We actually thought it looked like the Death Star from Star Wars. There are certain similarities, as you can see. But the basic elements of spatial and temporal signaling come to light in that signals transduce across the membrane, and then they are focused and insulated in discrete compartments within the cell. And it was within those regions that Tony's work was really focused on understanding the molecular architecture and the macromolecular machines that allowed this to happen and allowed it to happen efficiently. But before that, one has to understand how deeply these signaling processes actually influence cellular physiology. It goes from nerve impulses to cell division. We've already heard about cell division uh, and how important that is in cancer to muscle contraction. And clearly, these are fundamental processes where these individual events come to play because so many diseases are defective cell signaling diseases such as cognition and behavior, obviously cancer as we've heard about, and cardiovascular diseases. So the basic science had a clearly translational element and that was at the forefront of how Tony actually thought about this. But before one can really make exceptional scientific discovery, one has to be really well trained. And the early phases of a scientific career can be really quite itinerant. They may, may be really nice places that you go to, but you move around quite a lot. So Tony moved from Clare College, Cambridge, to the Imperial Cancer Research Fund Laboratories in London, to UC Berkeley, and then eventually as an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. Now, not only do these experiences equip you technically to be able to make progress, but you meet people along the way that are going to be absolutely influential at all phases of your career. And in, in Tony Pawson's case, none more so than his colleague, Tony Hunter. And this is a quote that Tony Hunter gave me. I first met Tony in 1974 when he was a student at IFCRF through a common interest in viral genomes. We could not have known it at the time, but our paths would cross innumerable times over the next 40 years. Now, that interest was something that was mentioned earlier about these genes, these viral oncogenes that are cancer-causing agents. And at those times, it was recognized that these viral oncogenes, many of them encoded protein kinases. And Tony Hunter's contribution was to identify phosphotyrosine as some of the modifications that these enzymes performed. Tony Pawson's uh, PhD mentor, postdoctoral mentor, and then Michael Smith at UBC, a colleague of his there, equipped him with various different experiences to allow him to really make what I think was probably the seminal discovery that really set the whole ball rolling. And it was with this viral oncogene, which was called P130 gag FIPS, or as it's now known, FES. And what Tony noticed was by looking at sequence analysis, from various different tyrosine kinases, there was a region of homology, which is shown in yellow that you could never see, that was common to all of these molecules, but it was not the region that transferred phosphate. It was a non-catalytic region, which he called the SARC homology two domain. That was because it wasn't the SARC homology one or the SARC homology three domain. But the important point was using the, the, the site-directed mutagenesis approaches that he learned from Mike Smith at UBC, he could interrupt this domain, and interrupting this domain converted cells from a transformed phenotype to a benign phenotype. So simply speaking, this modular structure of about 100 amino acids, which is shown here, according to Tony, all SH2 domains were blue, which is probably why you can't see it on a black background very well, but nonetheless, they were blue. This domain was responsible for the biological activity but not necessarily catalysis. So it wasn't really until we discovered that these SH2 domains could bind to other modular domains, in the case of this molecule GRAB2, they're actually SH3 domains, that the mechanism of action became clear, and it was stunningly simple. The SH2 domain was a phosphotyrosine recognition domain. It could recognize tyrosine phosphorylated proteins they would be recruited to this complex. 
other proteins that have stretches of proline regions were recruited to the SH3 domains, and together, this created a macromolecular signaling complex. Very simple, but fundamentally very profound. Now, there's, it's fair to say that much of this work obviously was, was, was pioneered and be, begun in Tony's lab with these seminal papers, but there were three other groups worldwide that were also involved in this research that really complemented the work that Tony did at the same time, and I think it's important to acknowledge them as well. So with that discovery, I think it's best capsulated by another quote, which is from Sir Philip Cohen from the University of Dundee. I vividly remember the audience being blown away when Tony first introduced his groundbreaking concept of SH2 domains during a lecture at the Royal Society London nearly 31 years ago. So this was a very important principle, and the SH2 domain was born, and the idea of protein modules became important. This is underscored by another quote here from, from Bob Lefkowitz, another former Gairdner awardee. His discovery, Tony's discovery of SH2 domain interaction with phosphotyrosine explains not only the mechanism of tyrosine kinases such as FES or FIPS or the able tyrosine kinase that's implicated in leukemia, but an even more general principle of modular protein interactions as one of the most important mechanisms of cellular communication. So now we've gone from this sort of enigmatic cellular communication to a molecular language that allowed us to interpret what was going to happen. And if you will, the, the letters and the words were made up from these protein modules, which come in many, many different flavors, that began with the SH2 domain. So the impact of this discovery was beginning to expand. It was, if you pardon the pun, going viral, given that it came from a viral oncogene in the first place. Another important development a few years later, and this is work that was done in Toronto at the Linenfeld, was work that Tony was involved with with Mike Tyers and Frank Sakeri, solving the structure of another domain that was responsible for recognizing phosphorylated proteins that targeted them for ubiquitin mediated degradation. This was called a phosphodegron. And the reason I bring this up, because it's going to be important at the end of my talk, it brought together two important forms of covalent modification, phosphorylation, which is prevalent, and ubiquitination, which is as equally prevalent and equally important. And so they came together in this kind of common macromolecular fusion. So those were the sort of molecular steps that led to the discovery of these modular interactions. But to quote one of Tony's trainees himself, Run Linding, in many ways the SH domain discovery was just a door being opened, and on the other side was this amazing world that Tony so elegantly described, and it excited many thousands of people. So the next phase in this process was to go from these isolated protein-protein interactions, which could be quite complicated, to look at this on the sort of background of a whole genomic network, because by now the human genome had been solved. And the way to do this was to combine genomic analysis with mass spectrometry, or proteomics as we, as we call it. And basically, it's relatively simple in that you isolate a protein complex and identify the presence of the proteins in that complex by looking for peptides and screening them against the genome. So if you have the peptides and you have a genome, you can begin to do this. That's the simple part. If you look at a protein complex by isolating one protein and mapping its binding partners, then isolate another protein and look for another subset of binding partners, you can begin to build together a more complicated picture that's shown here of what's called an interaction map or a protein network. Now, I vividly remember the first time that Tony was very excitedly showed me the first interaction network that he'd ever collected, and this is work he'd done with Charlie Boone. And it was in a rainstorm in a coffee shop in New Hampshire. And he said, oh, you've got to see this. You've got to see this. So I looked at this, and as a frequent flyer on United Airlines, decided that this was as close to the United Airlines map as we were going to get. I don't think I actually got the response that Tony wanted from me, on, from, we expected from that. But I think it was accurate. Because these proteins, such as LA17 or MIO5, are hubs. Proteins come in, and those are the modular proteins that, 
were described earlier. So you can sort of take this from the sublime to the ridiculous. This is a, a very elegant study done by many people looking at a complete interaction map where everything is somewhat connected. But if you focus back in on this area here and go backwards, this represents the last 17 or the human ortholog wave network that's very important in controlling actin reorganization and dendritic morphology in neurons. And some work that, that, that we did with Tony showed that mutations in this network also alter the actin-based morphology of these neurons that underlie learning and memory, and mutations can be involved in some of these human congenitively linked um, mental deficits. So clearly, the, again, there was a, a, a medical connection to this that became a recurring theme through all of the work that Tony did and that I'm going to talk about now. So that's a kind of introduction to the, 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 the sort of retrospective elements of the impact of, of Tony's work by picking just a few isolated examples. I think an equally important way of looking at this is to look at the human impact. And I think that King Holmes beautifully demonstrated how working with people is the absolute key to being able to have a long-lasting impact. And I think the quote I like from this is, is one from uh, Jim Woodgate, who is the director of the Linfeld Tannenbaum Institute, who took over this job from Tony about uh, seven or eight years ago. Pretty much every major university in Canada and many others worldwide have Poston trained faculty. It's an awesome signaling network that ensures his impact will be both lasting and meaningful. So this began with a lot of colleagues at the Linenfeld Institute, obviously Alan Bernstein and Janet Rossan, Mike Tyers, Dan Droshi, and several other people that are not in this picture, but that began as a nucleus for much of this work was done. But something that, that, that Jim lent me that I think really shows the impact of Tony is uh, an interactome that was put together by, by Gary Bader from the University of Toronto, showing major publications from these people, many of whom worked within Tony's group, that published 15 or more papers. As you expand that out to people that have published 10 or more papers, it becomes more complicated, until finally the complete output of 422 papers includes 1,546 co-authors. So you place that in the sort of um, intellectual output of the network onto the spatial element of the network, which shows the location as best as my assistant could figure out from the list we had of the location of current Poston trainees. And many of these dots represent multiple people. You can see it really is a global network. And this really does look like an Air Canada map of the world. So this really, together, I think represents the intellectual and the human legacy of, of Tony. And, and I think that knowing Tony as I do, it's as important to talk about the past as it will be to talk about the future. So the last three slides that I'm going to present really take off from what Tony's vision of the future would be. And in fact, what I'm going to do is present unpublished data with the permission of the authors that really answer some of the, the questions that are in this quote from Tony that was taken in a, an article that we wrote in 2010. If a desirable goal is to deftly manipulate the enzyme activity in space and time, then the future may lie in the burgeoning fields of synthetic and systems biology and the structural elucidation of macromolecular signaling complexes. So the first part of that, the operative word, is systems biology. And I really introduced this concept with these interaction maps, much of the work that was done here in Toronto early on. And to expand on that, I'd like to focus on the work, again, of Rune Lindig, who I've also mentioned, who's at the, the Danish Cancer Institute in, in Copenhagen. And this is a genomic map of the human kinome. There are currently in the order of 538 different protein kinases in our genome. They're represented here on the basis of their sequence similarity. What Rune has done is to combine this sort of analysis, of which many people have done, with a, what he calls a network kin analysis, 
We're using mass spectrometry, as I've already introduced. He's combined those two elements to not only position these molecules in terms of their genomic similarity, but to organize them in terms of their substrate selectivity. So functionally, they're more related than necessarily they are in a purely phylogenetic sense. So that's an added element of new information. And this is shown in the sequence specificity atlas of the Chinese world. And probably the more conventional view of the genomic analysis, which was actually done by Bernard Manning and, and Tony Hunter, is shown below here. So this adds an element of information that combines wet bench systems biology and bioinformatics. And very recently, and again with the permission of Rune, he's taken this to a personalized medicine level where they're beginning to use data and analysis from individual tumors to look at protein interaction networks where there are mutations and that are perturbed in individual cancers. And basically, you can just follow the colors and you can see that some of these mutations change the organization of these networks. And the sincere hope, it's a hope at the moment, is that this unpublished work will provide targets for therapeutic design of new therapeutics that can target, whether they be antibodies or small molecules, individual protein networks, to take out selectively a population of enzymes. So that's systems biology. The, the, the second postulate really focuses on the structural elucidation of macromolecular signaling complexes. And for this, I'm actually going to focus a little bit on some very recent and unpublished work that's coming out of my own lab. So the reason that Tony and I uh, were such close friends and, and colleagues and collaborators is that our, our views on the world were fairly similar. The, the possum view, as I've mentioned, is really this idea of ligand-induced assembly of signaling scaffolds, whereas the anchoring proteins, or ACAPs, that we study are pre-assembled, and they integrate different diffusible signals. These are really variations on a theme, although Tony would never believe that protein interaction modules included ACAPs. I'm glad we can prove him wrong. So we were pretty happy with our view of the world until about 10 years ago, both Tony and I were invited by Sidney Brenner to go to a meeting just south of Yokohama in uh, Japan, where it was just after the structure of the ribosome and uh, EM, cryo-EM technology had come on. And Sidney, in his own inimitable and charming style, basically berated us both for working with models that looked like this rather than having the higher order structures of these complexes. And as Tony said, we both politely hung our heads in shame and sort of walked off thinking about how to do this. So I'm glad to say that we've actually been able to do this now, and I'm going to present some very recent data that just shows how these modules exist in higher order complexes. And this is an EM structure of five proteins, an ACAP that was mentioned earlier, bound to a tetrameric peak A holoenzyme. These are the single particles that are allowed to solve these class averages. These are individual particles that are the nearest neighbor that you can use face recognition software to align. And from this pattern, you get the overall blueprint at about 31 angstrom resolution of the complex. If you have higher order crystal structures of the individual components, you can begin to put the molecular jigsaw together. And so here is one of the class averages. In green, you can see a region that binds cyclic AMP and a region in green here that binds the ACAP. Clearly a protein interaction module. And the catalytic subunits bind each of the R subunits there. Again, it's a protein-protein interaction module. But the difference is these are three interaction modules that are linked by regions of intrinsically disordered structure, as shown here. So they're like beads on a string. And so the way that these work is quite ingenious because not only do you have ordered structure in place, but you have flexibility as well. So here is um, EM analysis looking at the distance between these two lobes from a constricted, compact pattern to an extended pattern. And when you look on the EM grids, because you've got all these different molecules, these are equally represented. So there's a range of motion in these molecules, where in fact you can again use the real data to st simulate fairly accurately 
how this protein complex could move inside the cell. And again, the modular design that Tony mentioned is very evident, but they're held together and constrained. And where this really becomes important is for phosphorylation, because you can locally increase phosphorylation of a single molecule or allow the phosphorylation independently of two separated molecules. And just finally, we believe that this is very important in the eye, where these water channels have to be phosphorylated by this kind of configuration, because if you don't get tight control of phosphorylation, you actually get disturbances in the fluid movement in the lens and you develop cataract. So these macromolecular structures and this modular organization that Tony proposed is evident at a higher order. And then my final example in the final slide, or the, um, the second to last slide, focuses on this question of synthetic biology. Now, I've narrowly defined what synthetic biology is with the context of how Tony Pawson would think about protein interaction modules. And synthetic biology can mean a lot of things, but basically it means new enzymatic activities that can be brought together inside the cell. Where this is particularly prevalent is in bacterial pathogenesis. And we've heard a lot about bacterial pathogenesis already today. We've not heard very much about Shigella. If you don't know what that is, if I were to say that you well, understand what intestinal distress is all about, this is what's responsible. Basically, these bacteria have what's called a type three secretion system. That's a syringe that fires nasty elements into the endothelial cells of your gut, and the rest is history. What these elements are, are fragments of proteins. And the one I'm going to talk about is the outer Shigella protein G, or OSPG. And this is a molecule that attacks the NF-kappa B ubiquitination phosphorylation transcriptional pathway that's important for innate immunity. And Steve Elledge very briefly mentioned this earlier today. So this is a human complex, and this is a bacterial complex. And somehow, they have to come together to synthesize a new activity. And so basically, here we have an e ubiquitin E2 ligase charged with ubiquitin. So you have two protein interaction modules in the host component. And when you're infected with OSPG, which is about 190 amino acids, it avidly binds to all 10 E2 ligases when they have ubiquitin on them and work that was done at the University of Washington by Jonathan Pruneda and Peter Brusnick have shown that this complex creates a new enzymatic activity. So here's the structure, and really the important part to focus on is the turquoise part, which is the OSG component. Because to our surprise, what we discovered is that this OSG component bears a striking resemblance to a protein kinase. So this is a module that, when it's combined with the host modules, creates an enzyme that has some protein kinase-like characteristics. So, so we've done a very small amount of work. Donaldson Smith in my lab has worked with Jonathan and Peter to show that this is a histidine, sorry, not a histidine, a histone protein kinase that is active. And if you mutate kinase residues and affect this module, you prevent or decrease bacterial pathogenesis. So I think that you can see how this modular concept that Tony really proposed is very much alive and well and is moving forward in ways that we had never thought of. And that we really, the future is still very, very much bright for all of the concepts that Tony proposed. So I, I've come to the end of what I want to say and in some ways, this is a very bittersweet moment for me, because it's the end of a collaboration with somebody that's gone on for many, many years. But the hope and the beauty and the future of this is it's just the beginning of a whole new era of science that Tony was responsible for. And I think Tony's influence on cellular biochemistry has been enormous. And his enduring legacy are the new discoveries of his many trainees, some of which I've highlighted, many more of which I haven't had time to mention and the fond memories that remain with his friends, his family, and his colleagues of who he was and what he discovered and where that's going to take us.
Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very moving and beautifully articulated classic tribute to the late Tony Possum. Tony left us too soon. There is much research to be done, many questions to be answered, students and graduate students to mentor, friendships to be made, and families to be sustained. And yet, as John Scott has in a uni unique way described, he leaves a monumental legacy for all time. He was a great friend of Gardner, as an adjudicator, as a winner, as an advisor, and he was a great standard bearer in Canada for excellence, provocative to make it better, to enhance the platform of science in this country. So that's a mission that many others will have to take up. I think it's appropriate just to stand as a moment of respect to Tony Parson. Thank you very much. This has been a wonderful day. We've had six excellent awardees speak. Harvey Alter, Dan Bradley, <coughs> Stephen Elledge, Greg Winter, Jim Hogg, King, King Holmes, and then, at the, then John Scott. We're grateful to those who sp sponsored us today. And as you can see on the, on the uh, board there, their money's clearly been well spent. Tonight we will honor the six awardees at the Royal uh, Ontario Museum for their great scientific contributions. We'll also take a moment there to respect Tony. Our award winners will receive their prize and hopefully they will become not only uh, honored for the science, become members of the Gairdner family to carry on their contributions to science, to Canada and the world. Thank you very much.